You're watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. In the next half hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with the journalist and author Rachel Shabby and The Telegraph's leader writer, Tim Stanley. So there they are. Hello to you both. Let's have a look at what's on the front pages. The Observer describes the Jubilee festivities as a long weekend and a carnival of memory. The Telegraph highlights a comedy sketch shown during tonight's special concert in which the Queen co-starred with Paddington Bear. The Times calls the event the party of a lifetime for the world's grandmother. The Express quotes Prince Charles' speech, thank you for being there for us, mommy. The Sunday People pictures the guitarist Brian May above the headline, Gorilla Queen. Its sister paper, The Sunday Mirror, has a near identical front page with the splash rock and roll. While Scotland's Sunday National uses the occasion to argue against the monarchy and in favor of a second independence referendum. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code you see on your screen during the program, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while you watch us. And I was saying we're joined tonight by Rachel and Tim. There they are. Good evening to you both. Quite a night. Um, I'd just like to get your thoughts on that uh, concert. Rachel, were you watching? Um, I watched for about five minutes and then I hit my limit, I'm afraid. I just, it just didn't work. <laughs> Rachel, I knew, I just knew you were going to say something about that. I'm that predictable, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, what did you think? Rachel probably didn't care for the politics. I didn't care for the music. Uh, so... <laughs> oh, gosh, you guys. <laughs> did you... <laughs> It was a mixed bag. There was there, there was stuff that was uh, very good. I, I, it was undeniably a very very well put together choreographed show. It was a mix of the old and the new, and uh, every generation there was something in it for you. It was like a box of quality streets. So for my generation, Jonathan Jason Donovan turning up to sing "Any Dream Will Do," that that made the evening. Uh, as for the rest <laughs> of it, there were some bits I loved, some bits I loved. <laughs> that was the key moment of the evening for you, was it? So you're a musical theatre fan or a Jason Donovan fan? Oh, either, either. I just, it's just, it's just so, it's so great to see him back uh, performing. Really, I'm, I'm not, not that big a fan. But it was, it was, <laughs> it was a spectacular show. There's, there's no denying yeah. that, but. It's not everyone's taste. No, no, that's true, that's true. It was a spectacular show. Let's talk um, generally about this whole bank holiday weekend, the Platinum Jubilee. Rachel, the Observer calling it a carnival of memory, a long weekend and a carnival of memory. Yeah, look, you know, I think that's probably true for a lot of people. You know, I'm sure a lot of people up and down the country, as the Observer and other newspapers report, did experience it as that. But I think it's also just as important to say that a lot of people just didn't. That's the thing about Britain. We're not, you, you know, not sort of unified in this glory fest for the royal family. It's just not the reality. We can tell that because of the flags and the bunting that are ubiquitous in some kind parts of the country and not so much in other parts of the country. We can tell that from polling. We know that Scotland is kind of a bit indifferent. We know that younger people are pretty much not that into it and are of the view that the royal family is not going to be the royal family for that much longer. Of course, people who were lucky enough to have those extra two days off are delighted at that. Um, of course, it's nice to have a break, but I, I think we do need to be a little bit more um, nuanced and inclusive in our appraisal of this weekend. It wasn't wall-to-wall -wall flag waving from every member of the British population. Mm. Yeah, no, that's true, and we do have to remember that. Tim, what do you think? I mean, a lot of people looking at the festivities and thinking, well, my energy bill is still going to go up and I've got to pay my council tax at the end of this month. Oh, what a miserable way to approach life. <laughs> That's ridiculous. It's possibly a reality for towards... many. Do they, do, sorry, do they not, do they skip someone's wedding or someone's christening because the rest of their life is miserable so they're not going to partake in any kind of fun? I mean, that's a very odd approach towards life. Look, I did, I, I'll, I'll discuss republics versus monarchies later. What I, what I found interesting about the Guardian's piece uh, is that it sort of went there. And there's almost a journalistic consensus that you don't do this, which is you discuss the fact that the Queen... The Observer, let's, very... I, Tim, I just want to uh, bring it up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. you, you... You discuss the fact that the Queen is very, very old. And the writer, um, 
the writer Tim Adams described this weekend as a long goodbye, which is an interesting take and one I've not seen elsewhere. And, and he is right. Uh, there were some events that the Queen was physically too frail to attend, um, which he, he links that back to her appearance alone at Prince Philip's funeral. Uh, we have to get used to the idea that the Queen is winding down, that this is, the article quotes Sadiq Khan, a 24-7 job for a 96-year-old lady. And whilst this weekend was all about celebrating Queen Elizabeth II, what was striking was the prominent role played by Prince Charles and by the rest of the family. And that's what the Queen's life for the last couple of decades has really been gearing towards, protecting the institution and making sure that there are, there are people who understand it and care for it and are ready to take it over when she goes. So although the observer's tack is a little controversial and something journalists don't often do, I think they're quite right to draw our attention to this being a jubilee in which there was a sense of a torch being handed on. Mm. Um, Rachel, let's talk about something you brought up, Scotland and their view of this. How is the National tackling it? Well, I mean, the National is pointing out what, you know, Tim has de de described as miserabilism, but you, you could just say it's, it's just the reality of life. For many people in the UK at the moment, it is uh, the fact that, you know, life is pretty tough at the moment. There's a lot of anxiety around people having to make brutal decisions about how to prioritise money that just isn't going far enough, having to choose between putting food on the table or heating the home. This is the reality for people who are in work as well. We have an economy that isn't working. And so it is jarring to have at this precise time, this four day festival of actually an institution that probably does the most to cement a brutal inequality in Britain than anything else. It entrenches the class system, the deference, the idea that, you know, privilege trumps everything else. Um, that is one of the things that- What about know, breaking it down? And I'm gonna jump in. I'm going to jump in. What about breaking it down to a local level and saying, listen, we've had a tough two years. I want to show Tim, actually, because Tim has got his, his um, head in his hands. Listen, we've had a tough two years and we're all going to get together as communities, regardless of what we think of the monarchy, and just have a bit of a celebration for four days. Rachel. Well... That's fine, and I'm sure lots of people did that. What isn't fine is pretending that that is the reality for most of the country and trying to enforce the idea, as our front pages are doing this weekend, that that is the case. It's just not. It's like this huge juggernaut of publicity and branding. And it's just not a reality for many people in this country. OK, we've got, to, we've got to wrap there. Tim, Tim, I know you want to talk about this. We'll talk about it after the break, because coming up, we'll talk about this, but we'll also turn our attention to politics and a poll that could be troubling reading for the Tories ahead of the Wakefield by-election. With me now, Rachel Shabby and Tim Stanley. There they are back. OK, Tim, over to you. I did promise. Um, just to give your reaction to Rachel saying that, you know, listen, the Platinum Jubilee celebrations, they just don't resonate with everyone. Well, of course they don't, but they do resonate with the vast majority. The turnout of the Jubilee, I think, demonstrates that. Polls consistently show the monarchy is incredibly popular. It usually polls at around 69 to about 75 percent. Uh, as for the charge that uh, the monarchy is inappropriate in a time of poverty, well, it does a huge amount for charity and it promotes public service. As for the su suggestion that it is arcane, if you were watching the Jubilee concert, it was a celebration of diversity and equality. And also, um, Prince William gave a five minute speech about how important it is to save the environment. I think moaning about the monarchy during the Jubilee is like moaning about family during Christmas. Okay, maybe, maybe it's not for you, but most people are just getting on with it and enjoying it. And if you don't like it, just turn off the TV and don't watch it, which is what I have to do every time there's a Football World Cup on. <laughs> we won't get into football. We simply cannot get into football. Um, let's turn to politics. Oh, there's a happy, a happy subject. <laughs> um, OK, Rachel, uh, The Times. 
And they are talking about the Wakefield by-election and saying that the Tories are on course for defeat there. Just talk us through that one. Yes, so the Times is reporting that um, Labour has a 20-point lead in this seat. There's a by-election coming up in Wakefield, which uh, you remember the Tories uh, took from um, Labour in a, in a shock uh, result that was part of the crumbling of the Red Wall in that 2019 election for Labour. Um, now, this is thought to be worrying a lot of Conservatives, understandably. They were thinking, well, maybe the Red Wall, the so-called Red, Red Wall, is OK, after the recent lo local election results showed that Labour were not making that many inroads in that area. Um, and so this has come as a bit of a surprise, and it comes at the same time that there's thought to be some 67 letters calling for a no-confidence vote in the Prime Minister um, next week, far exceeding the, the threshold required to trigger that, and also some 190 MPs uh, um, thought to be ready to vote against Boris Johnson in such a vote, which, of course, is just 10 shy of... Um, toppling him and triggering a leadership election. Tim, I see you nodding. Do you think we're going to see a leadership election? Well, do you think we're going to see a no-confidence vote soon? And what do you think about this story in The Times about um, that by-election in Wakefield? Uh, my, my sense is that we are heading towards some sort of confrontation. The, the key thing about the by-elections is that one is a classic blue wall seat, a rural seat, always votes Tory. The other is a classic red wall seat, Wakefield, somewhere that the Tories picked up and that they need to win if they're going to hold the next election. Now, the, the argument for Boris was always that he could win the red wall and no one else can. If he loses it, and he loses it by a lot, that's going to shatter that reputation. If he also loses a blue wall seat at the same time, then what that will tell people is that he's also alienating the Tory heartland. So that in the event of an election, they're not only just going to lose up in the north, they're also going to lose down in the south. And that's what's going to really panic people uh, about Johnson's leadership. The strongest argument behind him has always been this uh, air of Boris is the only one who can win us a proper majority. But if he's defeated heavily in those two by-elections, that, I think, will, will change a lot of hearts and minds within the Conservative Party. OK. Tim and Rachel, thanks.